So I have this idea that I can't shake if Florida State and Clemson leave and the ACC kind of falls apart. Call it the United Coastal Conference, perhaps. You are locked on college football. Your daily podcast on all things college football. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On College Football. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view every day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your daily source to stay up to date with the biggest stories in the greatest sport on planet Earth, realignment, coach and carousel, the portal, and more. We've always got you covered. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. We'll check in on how Auburn's A-Day or spring game went, and is Texas A&M worth the hype? Well, that might be for you to decide all coming up on today's show. But think about this. Think about this possibility. Florida State and Clemson, let's say they get what they want. They leave the ACC. And let's say others scramble to find homes in power two conferences, probably at reduced rates. Maybe a couple teams like Louisville and Pitt perhaps go to the Big 12. They certainly feel like they would fit in the Big 12 in many respects. Maybe even NC State winds up in the Big 12. Let's just say that some schools are are left behind. This could be the new look ACC. This could be the new look Pac-12. Or you could form something new, like that scene in Ratatouille where Remy is teaching his brother about different flavors, and you've got a strawberry, and you've got a piece of cheese. And individually, they are two things. But what do you call the bite where you have a strawberry and a good piece of cheese together? Something new has been created. It could be like the United Coastal Conference just as an idea. This is just one to keep in mind on the back burner. This league would look a little something like this, uh, as, as, as dubbed as much, you know, by myself. If the only teams left from the ACC were Wake Forest, Syracuse, and Boston College, who I think are the teams least likely to be able to find good conference homes if the ACC just completely falls apart because of Clemson and Florida State and they just deem that, you know, bylaws and the conferences don't actually matter in any sense, your conference could look something like this. Oregon State, Washington State, Stanford and Cal. Remember, Stanford and Cal are currently in the ACC. Let's not forget that. You'd have those four teams out west in the middle of the country You'd have SMU and you'd pick up Tulane to pair with SMU as a travel partner. Makes a lot of sense, right? SMU already in the ACC. Tulane certainly has been buzzing about getting to a power conference, or at least on this show, that is how uh, I view them. And I think that's how many others do as well. Then out east, you would have Wake Forest, Boston College, and Syracuse. And then you would probably pick up Memphis or South Florida, maybe you would go with the Bulls in that situation because you want to be in the state of Florida. It's a valuable television market and recruiting base, but if Memphis is a better school, maybe that's where you would look. And then you'd have a base of 10 teams. That would be the foundation for your league, and you could kind of let that simmer, right? If the ACC ceases to exist come, let's say, 2026, when I think a lot of changes could come to fruition on the realignment front, then you would have that as a foundation of 10 teams. And this Super League, unfortunately, that I've talked about recently on the show, doesn't appear like it has a ton of traction at this time. Now, that can always change. Things change very quickly in this crazy world of college football and realignment. But, but, but. You have to be prepared, if you are these universities, for something like that not coming along and try to figure out, okay, what's the best league we can make? Well, if you were to put together this United Coastal Conference, again, just an idea. It's just an idea for a name. You could call it whatever you'd like. Or if you were to arrange 
a partnership or an alliance, perhaps. Those have gone really well in the past. Between the Pac-12 and the ACC, maybe you call it like the PAC-CC or something like that. See, that doesn't sound as good. I like UCC, you know, United Coastal Conference. Sounds pretty good. If you have a foundation of 10 teams there, then you can play that out for several years. And that's the best league you'd be able to put together at that time. If we then went truly to three power conferences, that'd be the best league you can compile. And then as you wait for the next round of realignment to fall, which feels like it'll be kind of late 2020s, early 2030s, when the media rights deals will be close to getting renegotiated or will be outright expiring, right? Like the ones that, you know, just got just got worked out in the Big 12 and the Big 10. And uh, the ACC's deal, of course, goes on and on. But in this hypothetical, there is no ACC because the ACC could just go by the way of the Pac-12, essentially. Now, this could get mildly complicated for Oregon State and Washington State because if they were to no longer play under the Pac-12 label, then their war chest might not be quite as expansive I am not entirely clear on what all the legal intricacies are, but my understanding is that the money that they are getting is contingent upon them continuing to play under the Pac-12 label. Label. So would they forego that money for money that would be potentially available to them in this new league, in this United Coastal Conference? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. That would depend on what the calculations are and what the television options are. But one of the biggest hurdles facing a Pac-12 rebuild right now is they have no media rights deal. Oregon State and Washington State are reportedly talking with the CW to air their 13 combined home football games in, in 2024. And there are some really valuable games in there. You've got Oregon and Oregon State usually gets a few million people. You've got Washington State and Texas Tech. That might be the biggest game outside of the Apple Cup for Washington State all season long. You win that game against a Big 12 dark horse contender in Texas Tech, and suddenly you are legitimizing yourselves in the eyes of the college football world. Because if you start racking up wins against the Mountain West, which along with the Americans, the best group of five conference in the country, well, if you're a 10 and two team and you got to win over Texas Tech, that can crack you into the top 25. And that's the sort of season both Oregon State and Washington State are looking to have right now. But I digress. Th this idea of putting together a league amidst those that have been left behind, I don't think you can rule it out. Because... There, there are very few things you can rule out in its entirety, right? You can rule out the Pac-12 ever being a power conference again. You can rule that one out, okay? You can, you can go ahead and do that. You can rule out the Big 12 or the ACC ever being able to catch the SEC and the Big 10 in terms of conference pedigree. You can rule that one out as well. But if the ACC falls, and as I talked about on last week's show, and schools like Syracuse, Wake Forest, and Boston College are left behind, they're not going to just sit there. They're not going to just go and try to be independents. I think Oregon State and Washington State are showing right now how hard that really is. It's difficult. It is challenging. And when you don't have a league that it is viewed with some level of, of respect by athletes. Look at what's happened with Oregon State men's and women's basketball right now. Players are hitting the portal like Catholic, Catholic rabbits repopulating. It is a rapid ascension or rapid accumulation of players that are leaving saying, mm, no, West Coast Conference is not good enough. And if there was a better option available where you were playing against more widely respected brands and name brand nationally recognizable schools, I think it could help along those lines. So that's my theory. That's that's my thinking for the United Coastal Conference. Now, this all pens what happens with Florida State and Clemson, because if they're not able to get out of the ACC, then the ACC continues. I don't think they have too much of an appetite, though they should, to add Oregon State and Washington State. I'd love for them to, but I don't think that that is going to happen. And Beaven Cook fans should uh, not be expecting that at this time. Let me know your thoughts in the YouTube comments. I know that you uh, mostly do anyway, so I don't have to encourage you too much on that front. Uh, Auburn had their spring game. Did you know that? Did you know that? Do you know what to watch for? Might not be what you think. 
Before we get to Auburn, this episode is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel and it's playoff time. In the NBA and NHL, baseball's in full swing. FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Playoffs, regular season, anything and everything you want. You want to bet the Masters, it's all over there. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 whether you win or lose. Does it get any better than that? I don't know. Maybe you're team winning a national championship but gosh that sounds pretty good bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks all in an app that is safe secure and super easy to use with a great interface what are you waiting for what are you waiting for ask yourself that question and then go visit fanduel.com slash locked on make your first bet an automatic win fanduel.com slash locked on fanduel america's number one sports book Auburn's spring game is in the books, and, well, Cam Coleman is the best thing, really, to come out of it. Zach yes. Blackerby locked on Auburn, joining me here on the show. The A-Day, or spring game, whatever you want to call it, on Saturday, year two for Hugh Freeze and the Tigers. Let's start with Cam Coleman. This guy Please. looks like he's ad, ad as advertised. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the best, if not the best, wide receiver in this uh, in this recruiting class, early enrollee, and we've heard nothing but incredible things. And in fact, I got criticized a little bit from some of the the everydayers of Locked On Auburn. It's like Zach, you're hyping this guy up too much, and I'm like, maybe I don't think so, but maybe. And I've been I've been waving the flag of like Auburn has never had somebody like Cam Coleman, and Auburn's had some pretty good football teams, but they've never had a receiver like Cam Coleman. And yes, it's a spring game. Yes, it's just a day. We call it a day down here, Spencer. But what he did drew like national attention this past Saturday. So, you know, just adjusting while the ball was in the air, some 50-50 balls where he's catching it in one hand, pushing a grown man off of him and going into the end zone. Auburn's just never had a number one option like that since like Terry Beasley. I mean, it's been over 20 years. Spencer, I don't even know if you were alive when Terry Beasley was playing. I, I I can't say the name rings a bell for me personally. I've seen my fair share of Auburn football. I think the earliest name I could go back. Michael Dyer. <sighs> Michael Dyer is a big name for you. Nope, that, that name doesn't ring a bell in any way, <laughs> shape, or or form. Uh, no, he, he, here's a here's a fun thing though about Cam Coleman. So you know he he wins offensive MVP as he should. He was the lone player to score a touchdown for Auburn offensively on Saturday. We go and, and you know we load up in the media room. We hear from Hugh Freeze. We're about to hear from Hugh Freeze and the main Auburn SID. She says, "Hey, we're going to hear from Coach, and then we're going to get players. Cam Coleman will be very brief. We've got to get him to prom." <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine being this kid who should be in high school? You have national, you know, attention, you know, every national college football outlet's tweeting about you. And then you go put on a tux and you go dance the night away at prom. I, I just think it's like it's Cam Coleman's world. We all just uh, we all just get to live in it. You know, I I uh, very proudly logged a round of golf, 18 holes before every high school dance that I went to. That pales in comparison to, yeah, I was winning offensive MVP and had national media asking me questions at <laughs> Auburn football practice. And then I that's went right. back and then I went back to my prom. Gosh almighty, what that that's mm, that's just quality content there. That's but great. Cam Coleman can only be as good as the guy throwing him the football, Zach. And that's expected right. to be Peyton Thorne going into A Day. You said you needed to see Peyton Thorne avoid the negative publicity. Did he accomplish that? I think so. I mean, I, I think regardless of what Peyton Thorne does, there's going to be a section of the Auburn fan base that say he didn't do enough. I almost think he could go undefeated this year, and Auburn fans would be like, in spite of Peyton Thorne, it's like, come on, <laughs> come on. I mean, I think we need to have proper expectations for what this offense can be. And I think Peyton Thorne, he's been in college football for a long time. We kind of know what he is. I do think he's better than he was a year ago, and they've done things to help put pieces around him. Guys like Cam Coleman, Robert Lewis is a transfer wide receiver that you and I talked about when we previewed Auburn's 8 day game going into the weekend. He led Auburn in catches, had five catches for 70-something yards. It's like that's those are the kind of pieces you need to put around these quarterbacks that need a little bit of help. And, and I think Peyton Thorne is, is kind of in that tier of college quarterback. The O-line, I think, is going to be good enough. Can these pass catchers be good enough? And I think the scheme's going to be better with Hugh Freeze kind of putting more uh, more time and emphasis on it. So 
I thought Peyton was by far the best of the four quarterbacks. I think Hank Brown's going to be a really solid backup. And I think Holden Gurner is going to transfer when the portal opens next week. We'll see what happens there. Um, but yeah, I, I think Peyton Thorne was okay. I think Peyton Thorne showed what you needed to see. And just a reminder, like Peyton Thorne wasn't a part of Auburn's program last spring. And, and I think that stuff matters, Spencer. Yeah, and I, I think going into this year, Auburn fans should probably have tempered expectations for Peyton Thorne as it pertains to the sorts of numbers that he could put up. But the Tigers' win total over at FanDuel it is seven and a half. If they're going to go over that number, Peyton Thorne has to play good football. But if he plays the way he's capable with Cam Coleman, with an offensive line and running game that was prolific in the SEC last year, should be good again this season for Hugh Freeze and company. Where can Peyton Thorne fit into the realm of SEC quarterbacks? I think if Peyton Thorne's a top half SEC quarterback, Auburn probably wins eight or nine games. I think it hits the over on the FanDuel side of it. But I don't really know his path to doing that quite yet. I mean, if you're going to you're going to rank all the quarterbacks in the SEC, like he's not top 10, right? Like I, I don't think I can name seven SEC quarterbacks that I know Peyton Thorne is going to be better than. So he's going to have to kind of lean out over his skis a little bit. I think Q Freeze is really going to have to help implement an offense. I, more and more stories keep coming out of like how bad and how unorganized Auburn was offensively a year ago. And that's not on Peyton Thorne. And, and to some extent, it's on Hugh Freeze, but he put such an emphasis on recruiting. He hired a former head coach in Philip Montgomery to come in and lead the offense. But you're hearing more and more things about it. You're, you're hearing players in, in public press conference type scenarios talk about how much more organized it is now than a year ago. And it's night and day. It's way simpler. Everything seems to make more sense. And they're doing things with intention. And they didn't do that a year ago. I mean, this is a guy who's just been thrown under the bus over and over and over again, including by Hugh Freeze pretty much every week of the season last year. I think the offense is going to make a whole lot more sense, and that's going to give Peyton Thorne an avenue to be a top-half quarterback in the conference. What are the biggest questions still looming for Auburn or the biggest weaknesses that you saw that you know either confirmed your priors going into A-Day or you saw something that made you go, wow, I, I didn't think this was a problem, but this could be an issue in 2024 and maybe needs to be addressed in the portal? Yeah, the two biggest questions I had going into spring, the two biggest questions I had going into A Day this past weekend are still the two biggest questions that I have now. And Hugh Freeze addressed them both kind of without us having to ask or pry. But the receivers, like they're better than a year ago, but it's still not enough. They're going to have to add another receiver or two via the portal for depth. And I also think some guys are going to leave uh, when the portal opens next week. So. Wide receiver still needs to be better. And I think some of that will take care of itself with Cam Coleman and then you know, Perry Thompson, the other five star receiver. He's not on campus yet. You know, adding him going over the summer and into the fall, I think will help too. But they they need a little bit more firepower there. Can they add that via this portal window that's about to start? Then the other one's defensive line. And funny enough, the defensive line was surprisingly good. On Saturday, I do think a lot of that, I don't want to take too much away from those guys because I do think they overperformed at least what I was expecting them to, and I don't want to take that away from them. But the way and kind of the nature and the setup of how 8A was, was structured, I, I do think it benefited the defensive line in regards to the offense really wanted to throw it. They didn't really want to put a whole lot of emphasis on, on running the football. It's very vanilla stuff. They were able to tee off a little bit. So they they outperformed my expectations and a lot of people's expectations on Saturday, but still they um they need to add some big guys, some big, big meaty boys on uh on the defensive line once the portal opens next week. You know, I've always kind of lamented that vanilla means plain or boring or simple, because vanilla itself it's is a great flavor. One, it's it's a great flavor. And, you know, in vanilla ice cream, is it the strongest flavor? Maybe not, but it could be. If you throw like a little raw vanilla in there, suddenly you got something that's a lot more potent and, and you know, spicy, but in the sweet sense uh, of sorts. So vanilla yeah. has got a negative connotation. We here at Locked On College Football are working to change that and to keep you all as informed as possible. Zach Blackerby, Locked On Auburn, helping me out here today. Zach, thanks, man. Of course. Love you a long time.
Likewise. And uh, I've, I've got a question for, for the people out there. Did you know that there's some hype around Texas A&M this year? Have you ever heard that story in college football before? Have you, Zach? No, I've, I've, I've never seen it. Their win None. total. Mike They're... Elko's not that good, folks. Well, on that note, let me just pose a question. Are they worth the hype? We're going to answer that after this. No. Before we get to Texas A&M, this episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which, as frustrating as it is for me, is still something I enjoy. I'm a Mariners fan, so it's uh, suboptimal here to start the year. But getting tickets is even faster and easier with Game Time. Prices on Game Time in the app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch, which is a lot better than going up. So with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat and their lowest price guarantee, game time takes the guesswork out of buying Major League Baseball tickets. You can save up to 60% buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, whatever you want. Game time's the place to go. You can save even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game or event. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-C-O-L-L-E-G-E. That's Locked On College for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today not tomorrow today last minute tickets with game time lowest price guaranteed texas a&m has routinely over the last several years been the butt of jokes in college football and here we are once again spring football has rolled around and everyone's starting to think about how close college football is and whether or not texas a&m is a legitimate team in the SEC as far as it goes to, you know, contending for a conference championship. Do you know the last time Texas A&M put a double digit number in the left column? That's the win column. Do you know the last time? 2012. Mm, mm. There was this guy, Jonathan Manziel. He went by Johnny Football. That's the last time Texas A&M put up a double-digit win season. Now, there was the COVID year. They had a lot of success. But again, it's been quite a long time. So when you look at the FanDuel win total and say, wait a minute, are we doing this again with Texas A&M? Whether it was the Kevin Sumlin teams or the Jimbo Fisher teams or at any team that we have seen, it feels like Texas A&M wins the offseason but never wins during the season. So now Mike Elko takes over. He was their defensive coordinator. He was the head coach at Duke. He's now the head coach at Texas A&M. And Jimbo Fisher's making $75 million to not coach Texas A&M football. Look, I understand work gives you purpose and work gives you a routine, but that's not a bad life. That is not a bad life. So their fan to, their, their fan duel win total, Texas A&M, is eight and a half. And I'm sure a lot of people are rolling their eyes going, oh my gosh, here we go again. Here we go. Texas A&M, oh yeah, winners of the offseason. Is Mike Elko that sort of guy? I will not speak for uh, Zach Blackerby. He spoke for himself earlier on the show and whether or not he thinks Mike Elko is any good. We're going to find out this year how good Mike Elko can be. This is not something that is going to need to marinate for a while. I'm not saying you need to see, you know, a, a conference championship or even an appearance in 2024, even though I think this year's Kalen DeBoer Alabama team will be the worst team that he has. I think they're going to be good, by the way. But year one, there's going to be a transition element. There's going to be an adjustment and whatnot. So Alabama is about as down as they are going to be relative to Alabama standards. They're also not on Texas a and schedule. Yeah, remember that one. Uh, do you know who has the second highest rated transfer portal class according to 24-7 Sports? That's the Texas A&M Aggies. This is not a coaching move bringing over Mike Elko that has gone under the radar. He's not going to a program that fails to attract talent. What Texas A&M has failed in over the years is the ability to be well-coached and well-prepared and 
just be able to flat out execute with the talent that they do have. Now, there have been a lot of big time names that have gone elsewhere. You can look at Walter Nolan going to Ole Miss along the defensive line. LT Overton on the offensive line left. Evan Stewart went to Oregon. Lots of names have left the program. Do you know how many transfers Texas A&M has brought in this year? Did you know that the answer is 24? Well, now you do. 14 of those transfers, by the way, are coming from Power 4 institutions. That doesn't mean that they're the only transfers worth mentioning. That doesn't mean they're the only transfers that are going to make an impact this year. I'll get to the quarterbacks in just a moment, but I expect Cyrus Allen to be one of the guys that they are throwing the football to there week in and week out, whether they're at College Station or, or on the road. Because when you look at what Allen did last year at Louisiana and you say, well, Evan Stewart is, is not there, and Allen, you know, almost 800 receiving yards – with uh with louisiana tech that that's the sort of guy who comes in and is not going to go to texas a&m and be as highly coveted of a transfer portal recruit if he's not going to play so just because you're coming from a lower level institution doesn't mean you can't be a big impact guy how many times whoever you are a fan of in college football and you're listening to or watching the show right now i thank you for doing that by the way how many times has a guy come from a group of five school or the FCS level and made a big impact? One guy who is coming from the power level, but maybe isn't generating a whole ton of buzz to people outside of Texas A&M that I wouldn't sleep on is EJ Smith. He's a running back. Now, if you think Smith and running back and think about the letter E as a first name, you may be wondering whether or not this individual has any relation to Emmett Smith. You'd be correct to think that because as a matter of fact, he does. EJ Smith is the son of legendary running back Emmett Smith. He went to Stanford for a couple of years and wasn't able to carve out a consistent role. There were uh, a couple of injury problems, but primarily he was in the middle of Mm, not the best time of Stanford football. Wasn't able to carve out a role. If you told me right now that EJ Smith pushes for a thousand yard season this year, I'd believe you. He's got that sort of talent. He is an incredibly balanced running back. But 24 transfers in total for Texas A&M this year, which leads to the next question. Well, how many teams on their schedule are going to compete with that? Sure, they had a bunch of guys leave, but look at all the guys that they brought in. They come in at all sorts of different position groups. By the way, they've got a top 20 high school recruiting class. That's never been the problem with Texas A&M. So when you ask yourself the question, are they worth preseason hype? You need to then ask, well, what sort of hype are we talking about here? A win total of eight and a half, I think is warranted. Here's why. I'm going to list to you in order every team on Texas a and schedule. And from there, we're going to think about how many times they are just going to be outmatched with roster talent. Are you ready? Notre Dame, McNeese, Florida, Bowling Green, Arkansas, Missouri, Mississippi State, LSU, South Carolina, New Mexico State, Auburn, and Texas. How many of those teams, when I listed them, jumped out to you as, oh my gosh, they have way more talent than Texas a and I, Texas and LSU are the only ones I think even have more roster talent across the board than Texas A&M. You could maybe toss Notre Dame into that mix, but it's at the very least comparable. You know how I know that? Their week one game on August 31st, which can't get here soon enough, is Texas A&M minus one and a half against Notre Dame. Do you think Notre Dame's a good football team? I do. I, I do. I think Marcus Freeman's a good coach. I think Notre Dame's a good team. I think they've brought in Riley Leonard, who Mike Elko knows quite well since he was, when healthy, his quarterback at Duke for the last couple of seasons. And Vegas thinks that at home, Texas A&M, slight favorite there. So you've got three teams that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe roster wise with Texas A&M. Well, that's been the case in years past. But you've got a guy in there who went 16-9 and nine his last two years as the football coach at Duke. When you think about Duke and anything about them, football is the third thing that comes to mind. Number one, basketball school. Number two, premier academic institution. And number three, football. Because, well, we just all love college football and we know that, that Duke plays it, of course. But that's kind of the extent of 
what you think nationally, what a lot of fans think across the country of Duke football. But Mike Elko had them in a space where he's beating Dabo Sweeney. Do you think that guy can coach? Because I do. I, I do. I know Zach Blackerby doesn't believe in him. Locked on Auburn host. If you think that, or if you, if you think that Zach is wrong and want to let him know, his channel's freely available over on YouTube. You may drop him a comment. But I think that for, for Texas A&M, the question is not whether they have a good enough team to win nine regular season games. They have a workable schedule. There's no Georgia. There's no Alabama on there. You do have to go um, at Auburn on November 23rd. I would not sleep on that. But their two toughest SEC games, in fact, their three toughest games roster-wise that I mentioned are all at home. November, or sorry, August 31st against Notre Dame. October 26th against LSU. And then Texas comes to town in a classic SEC matchup. Oh, boy. That's going to be a spicy game. That's going to be a spicy, spicy game on November 30th to end the regular season. All three games, their three biggest, hardest games, the best teams they'll play, it's at Kyle Field. They're all at Kyle Field. This is an incredibly workable schedule in the SEC. You've got a coach who's got plenty of talent. And the question may very well come down to, what are you going to get from the quarterback position? Is Jalen Henderson going to push Connor Wigman at all? Is Connor Wigman the starter? Does he have enough weapons? I think so. I think there's still plenty of talent there for Texas A&M to be a good team as long as they reasonably play complementary football. I don't expect Connor Wigman to be someone that pushes for a Heisman Trophy or you know first or second team All-SEC but certainly, this feels like a Texas A&M team that roster-wise has got the capability to play good, solid, complementary football. Will they? That, that's going to come down to every individual Saturday that gets played this fall and whether they can execute. But are the pieces there for this to be the year Texas A&M pops? I got to tell you, we watched Purdue play in the national championship game yesterday. They would had their struggles in the tournament. And it all came together. How many people going into the tournament? Me. It was me. I said, refused to pick Purdue because, well, they haven't done it in the past. Well, that doesn't mean they weren't capable. That just means they didn't. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. And until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.